All right, there, folks. This, uh, this is my first trial of using my new camera layout here. This is a cheap old camera I picked up at Walmart for twenty bucks, twenty-five bucks. I rigged it up to a telescoping arm that we use for, uh, you know, the selfie stick thing I got for five bucks. Got some C clamps on the table, which you can't see. A little duct tape. Man cannot have enough duct tape in his life. Very useful tool. Okay. Like I said earlier in my previous vlog, there's some topics of rules heavy, chunky heavy, and also having coming up things from scratch. When you find yourself in a situation where you just don't have the material you want, you don't have access to game material you need or want to play the game that you'd like, and you start out with pen and paper and an idea in your head and a couple players who are agitating to help motivate you along. Pen, paper, very, very most important tool right there. Man, it'll take me a while to get used to this sort of stuff. So, core book, blueprint guide, equipment guide. Concept here is a working title, Interstellar Frontiers. This was the name I came up with, and yes, I'm familiar that there's Star Frontiers and, and, and uh, other game systems that the titles are similar, but they're not the same. The mechanics behind the game are not the same. Also considered what you call a uh, hard-end, in-depth, detailed, rules-heavy game system. There is actually probably 10% of this is fluff. Most of this is hardcore mechanics because we needed them. And some 321 pages roughly in this core book. I can't tell you exactly how many entries are in here because I've pretty much broken down everything by category and by chapter by and by primary categories. Uh, the system, one of the things that I found myself in a, in a situation where you live far enough into the, into the country, and there's some of you guys that grew up this way and you understand, you just don't have the people to get together. You just don't have the game enthusiasts in numbers enough to support a group. And you'd think that would be surpri you know, surprising in the modern era, but it still, it still applies. And in some locations, even mentioning these sort of things to the average Joe Q public gets you some pretty side sidebar looks. It can actually get you, I won't call it shunned, but you can get uh, uh, distanced by the other people who don't consider you normal or something wrong with you because they don't understand it or they don't want anything to do with it. And for the large chart of them, they don't like to read. The reading part is what throws a lot of these people off. They don't want to have to do anything other than pick up a, a, a console and then just, you know, this all the stuff's done for. No brain power thinking required. And I know the arguments. I know the arguments of the gaming people that tell you that there's a lot of strategy and thinking and stuff that goes on in creating uh, or playing video games, but I'm sorry, I'm in the category that believes that you're going to get far more cerebral stuff out of things like this than you'll ever get out of that console. That's just my opinion, although who knows, another 20 years, the consoles have come a long way. Video games have got a long way to go before they get the the adaptability and creative power that pen and paper type book versions will give us. So, didn't have a group of people, couldn't get enough people together on a regular basis to make a difference, didn't have access to my, my stuff, and I found myself with a lot of extra time on my hands, and I'm not a, I don't like playing card games, I'm not a gambler, uh, I don't want to argue with people over what we're going to watch on television, and after a while, you know, everything starts to get blurred together. Uh, first couple of seasons of Walking Dead was great, then it turned and went south. And that seems to happen. Some TV series I got into, and then they, for whatever reason, they didn't get enough uh, play, they didn't get enough uh, stats or data or whatever, not enough interest, and the, and the producers cut it. You know, the company said, no, nope, we're not going to make enough money off of it, so let's go ahead and chuck that. So I started out thinking, I want to play a game. I, myself, me, want to play a game. And I don't have anybody. So how do I go about doing it? 
And first thing I thought about was some of the old game systems I played back in the day that used a percentile based system. I also was thinking about some of the type of computer games that I enjoy playing. And your civilization, your Command and Conquer, uh, Command and Conquer uh, Empire, uh, uh, World of Empire that they got on video now, the, the, uh, uh, you see where I'm going. Uh, sim, the, sim, the various Sims games. These are things that you build stuff and expand things and still have some interactions on some degree. So I thought, how can I do something of that nature? So I decided to create a science fiction game and it started out very, very simple. I think the first set of rules I created was about this big and it was mostly to remind myself so I didn't forget the basics of what I was doing. Very basic stuff. Didn't need a whole lot. I kept adding additional material to make substance but not the rules themselves. And then I had a couple people come along and they got interested in it because if they could take it home, they could do it on at their time, at their leisure, at the odd hours of the day or night because you know when you work on if you work a night job you're sleeping during the day and you just don't have those regular hours that you would in certain scenarios. And if you've worked those hours, you know what I'm talking about. It just adds to the problem of getting a good group, a good group game time together. So I said, I'm going to make something that I can play by myself without a whole bunch of people. And these other people come along and said, I'd like to play it too. So I Xerox off a copy of what I had and gave it to them. And they immediately come back and says, well, how do I do this? How do I do that? I want to do this, but the rules don't let, or it doesn't tell me if I can or can't. What I realized was quite a bit of those rules that were in that thin version were also up right here in the noggin in my brain. So I knew that I had to come up with, you know, there you go. And I had to come up with a freaking thing I had to better explain what I was what was in my head to these folks, so anybody could pick it up and go from here to here to here and get the desired results they wanted. This resulted in a book about yay big, maybe a little bigger. Then, as this slowly progressed over a couple more years, uh, the players that came and go, a couple of them stuck it out with me, and they kept wanting to do more stuff. They wanted to know how do we do? How can I spy on an opponent? How, how can I how can I hack into a computer system? How can I do this? You know, and I had to come up with more rules and explanation for those rules. And then we rolled, you know, we played them out. We made sure they worked. We went back and revised them and revised them and revised them to get where we want. Then we ended up with two books, roughly this thick right here each and the reason for that was is because I didn't have I didn't think of binding stuff I was using a, an oversized stapler so I could at most I could staple about, staple about a half inch stack of paper together so I had two roughly half inch halves of what would have been the entire game system and then uh, once again people come back says well I don't understand this how do we do this I started, re, went back and from the beginning, rewrote everything, reviewed everything, always adding new stuff, taking some of the old stuff out that didn't work, cons consolidating some things and making them so that they were generally useful over several different applications as opposed to having three or four individual applications for the same, more or less the same thing. Uh, I also started coming up with a little bit of artwork. I have, as you can see, spots in this version where I would put artwork, and I have some stuff. And I had started working on a digital version of this, and I had it about half done when my laptop back in January, first of the year, took a dump. I did some foolish on it, and uh, my, my backup for this stuff, I can't find it. I knew I had one somewhere, but I hadn't backed up in a while, and so I got to start over from scratch, digitally speaking. It's a pain in the butt. And yes, I know there's programs that you can scan and it will read, but I'm telling you, it don't read well. It takes a look at all the nuances that are going on here, the different font sizes, the 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 images and icons that are in here, and then it barfs up all over the page. So you have to go back page by page and check every single line. So it's faster than typing, which uh, so I have I'm in the process of have done have done it, am doing it, but it's still a lengthy, painstaking thing. And I was hoping that the game company was going to do all this stuff for me uh, when they picked up the contract. And they talked about doing it, but 
in 16 months to two years. We're not even into a year yet, so we still got a ways to go. The uh, early initial concept was to use a percentile based D100 system to create this game where you are a potential house lord of, a, of, this, of your own empire, your own star empire, uh, your own stellar empire. And you start out with at, at a very low rank with a colony ship with 10,000 people on board and two, two scout ships and two mining ships and some assorted other what have you. And you're stuck in the middle of some system that's never, a region of space that's never been explored. You're at the frontier or just beyond the frontier. So you have to find a planet that's suitable. You know, the game gives you six cycles or six rounds to do this before the population on your ship starts to self implode. You only have so many supplies on board. And at that point, uh, they reach a 50% loss for, and they, they, will, they will settle whatever's handy. And if that means settling an airless asteroid or a moon like, like our moon, then so be it. And you have to either, either reboot the game or you deal with the extremely high build modifiers for that kind of environment. Now I beta tested that very environment and it's a doable game. You can still play. It just means that your your colony, your, your capital world is going to be very small and hard to develop. So you'll usually immediately try to find some much more conducive planet, uh, conducive planet and start colonizing there. The difference is the game mechanics doesn't allow you to shift everything from here to there. Once the colony ship, set, ship sets down, it's dismantled and used to create the builds, the factories, the housing, the, the spaceport, the power grid, everything that your colony needs. And your goal now is to use the scout ships to explore the neighboring space, find more systems, find more planets, discover what resources they have, send your mining ships to mine them, bring those resources back to your colony, use those resources to manufacture materials. Then you're you have a set of blueprints for building additional builds, factories, housing, different specialty builds, that sort of thing. And it tells you, I need so much housing material, so much uh, steel, so much construction material, so much lead, whatever. And you then gather or manufacture, stockpile, then build the build. So the rules started out pretty easy and simple and my concept was to use charts this is what makes it easy for solo play I don't need other players although I've played games and I've run games with other players and it's quite entertaining there's lots of entertainment to be had but it makes it seem like there's a lot of extra rules lots of serious heavy rules what you don't get at first glance is for as an example here's four pages of this book that result that are that's specifically two charts uh, using planetary exploration chart one, planetary exploration chart two as an example. So when my scout ship or other ship is scouting this planet, the planet's broken up into 10% 10% slices. So you you search it 10% at a time. Once you've determined that it's breathable, because certain planet conditions negates a lot of stuff. Uh, but if it's a breathable planet, for example, then we can say, I've discovered a primitive alien civilization. Roll a D100 times 50,000, add a quarter million, and then roll a percentage and say, okay, I've discovered half a million Bronze Age aliens living on a planet. Now you have to decide, can you, do you trade with them, you meet with them, you negotiate with them, you conquer them, you exploit them, you eliminate them. What are you going to do? Another potential for another 10% is hostile fauna discovered, carnivorous. See developing worlds and designing fauna and flora chapter for the stuff you need to create the creature that you just encountered. Now you've got a planet that's on the same planet. you got a planet with a primitive alien life force, alien civilization, along with some pretty nasty beasties running around on the planet. You can think of a dozen, you know, a dozen sci-fi uh, worlds that come to mind right from current media uh, uh, franchises we know right off the bat come to mind. So, there's planetary exploration chart three. 
Now I have charts for entering a solar entering a solar system for the first time, entering it on a regular basis. We have exploration for exploring planets. We set up our colony. Now our colony each cycle will get a roll on one of the call uh, the event charts, which allow us to see what things are so events, you know, we have a natural disaster, we can have a plague, uh, we can find a valuable resource, we can uh, have a, a street festival break out, and it benefits the tax base for the planet for a while. Uh, then we also, each planet also gets, uh, each class A planet gets a ship traffic roll, and in this case, we roll and it says here, a merchant ship arrives, roll for ha a hall class, don't forget to apply, apply your notice, uh, noble status modifier. Now, this whole concept here is based off of what rank your, no your noble is. So if you're a squire, which is your beginning, you get a negative 50% to most your rolls when it comes to things like this. That's going to prevent you from getting when it comes to foes. So pirates arrive or bandits arrive, you're not going to get a, a battalion sized group of gutter gangs showing up or, or a, reg, a, a fleet of pirate ships arriving over your tiny colony that has one ship and maybe two starfighters to defend itself. 50% says it's going to get one or two pirate warships and they're going to be in the small to medium category size. Should be easy enough for your defense forces to deal with or to run off if you choose to do so. And therein lies part of the, the base of the, of the rules. A lot of these rules are dependent on the player deciding they want to go there. Obviously some of these you need to do every every turn in order to continue de developing and exploring and doing the things you need to or wish to do. But if you don't want to do a pirate show up and you don't want to deal with them, just accept whatever the outcome is, eat it, and move on. If you choose to duke it out, the mechanics are there for, for combat. The pirates have a set of charts which will allow them to react and act to actions based off of your you your you know your fleet so if your ship attacks uh, based on its success ratio then the, the the bad guy roll you roll on their reaction chart and it determines whether or not they stand to and and, and trade shots or do they run away or do they try to negotiate and obviously as they take damage they're more likely to run away and more likely to negotiate than they are to keep taking damage so the game the game mechanics are, they sound complex, and to some degree, they can be complex. But once you get the, the gist of them, it's actually pretty simple to, to, to take care of. Now, a merchant ship can arrive, and you could choose to negotiate with the captain. We have negotiation rules. Now, when I say this is not an RPG, doesn't mean it doesn't have character potential characters and character classes. There's a, several chapters in here that talks about things like having uh, your house lord has six primary ministers. Each one represents a certain ministry. Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Intelligence, Ministry of Culture and Education, Ministry of Health and Science as examples. And those ministers are ranked NPCs. They have some experience, they have some skills, and their bios, their skills, you pretty much put all of their information on a, on a 3 by 5 card and for simplicity's sake because you're going to run off of percentages. They get modifiers so if they're, they're going to negotiate with a captain who's much more experienced than they are they're going to have a harder time getting that captain to agree to things that they want or they're going to, it's going to cost more. That's just the simplicity of it. Or the reverse is the same way. It's plausible for your character, your NPC to get advanced enough that it will when when you nego have that negotiation, the other person is pretty much going to be a, going to cave and give in and give you pretty much whatever you want within those parameters that's set up. Now, of course, it's easy to cheat in a game when you're playing yourself. You get out of it what you get out of it. So if you choose the bend rules or to over uh, to be over generous, that's on you. I make points of not doing that when I play the game. I don't do that. I'm just pointing out if you choose, that's on you. So I got things like guild traffic, and I got independent friends or fringe organizations, so on and so forth. I got a whole chapter on creating alien races, or what we call genomes. The lion's share of genomes in Star Frontiers are actually human-based people, uh, where we've taken we've taken a DNA 
sample of DNA and genetics from, I don't know, a bird and cr cross typed it in a very advanced method uh, with human humans to end up with what we call in this in this example aviaries, which are humanoid human hybrid bird people. They can fly. They have a lot of attributes that birds have. They are smaller than the average human, lighter. They have their advantages and disadvantages and so on and so forth. So we talk about blueprints and I'll show you the base one. Okay. Base a base storage facility designed to hold a certain amount of tonnage on everything you manufacture everything you manufacture or all the mineral resources that you could potentially uh, harvest or mine, you have a stockpile of them. In this case, to build this place, it says, I need one ton of chemicals, half a ton of construction material, half a ton of tools, 0 0.2 tons of industrial vehicles, and 0 0.2 tons of industrial uh, or utility vehicles. So, we don't need a whole lot to build a shed. That's what this is. Now, if I build this on that airless moon where I have a, t a times 10 modifier, then things get expensive. Now I need 10 tons of this, 5 tons of this, and so on and so on. And of course, the bigger the builds, the more complex, the higher technology they are, the more they do, the more expensive they're going to be. See, here is a tech, uh, a tech four heavy industrial center, and, and you can see this whole section here is all the material and manufactured manufactured and mineral resources required at a 1.0 build modifier. So in this case, you need 190 tons of copper. So if I was building this on that moon, it would cost, I'd need 1,900. So you can see how much harder it is to build more elaborate settlements on much more hostile in, uh, places. Now, one more thing, and we'll zip over to it, is uh, shipbuilding. One of the things that I chose to do because I was playing this by myself was instead of having some kind of pre-made set of rules books on ships like you know here's my here's starcraft one from space opera you know here's a listing of generic ships more or less different categories and class and their blueprints okay well i don't have a game company producing things for me like this so i came up with a design based off of uh, ship components so you you manufacture purchase or salvage ship components and then you assemble them into categories so your class one tech category for a hull is a tech one hull that the mass itself is 24 tons but it can overall tonnage in equipment uh, components is 224 so i've already got 24 of it used up as the hull so i have 200 tons of space and in that i need to put sublight drives drives life support crew quarters uh docking docking connect uh, uh, hard point connectors for docking with other ships cargo bays if i'm going to have them weaponry if i'm going to have them shields if i'm going to have them and everything is a balance so uh certain certain elements are required you cannot have a fuel you cannot have star drives or sublight drives without having fuel cell you have to have it can't have a ship at all if you don't have a life support system and a crew deck people got to have a place to operate and live and they got to be able to breathe doesn't matter what kind of species you create if they breathe methane then you got a life support system that creates methane doesn't matter the mechanics are the same so in that perspective we then can assemble ships and we divide, devise our own classes. So I give some examples of that using Tech 1 based hulls. You've got the scouts, light freighters, gunboats, and cargo cutters, combat cutters. The difference between a cutter and a ship is the starlight. If I choose to build a a freighter that's just going to run inside of a system from one planet to the moons or the planet to another planet in the same system I'm not required to have a, a sub uh, uh, I'm not required to have a star drive or a navy computer they're not necessary so that saves 20 tons or so that I could then put additional cargo bays and sublight drives to haul that cargo around and in that case it becomes a cutter so it's incapable of traveling from one system to the next without assistance we can create tugs we can create bigger ships that can carry these things attached to their hard points as an example
Same thing goes with warships. If I make a combat cutter, it's likely to be much more robust than a gunboat because a Tech One gunboat is a small, small, the smallest warship in in the ship class, and a cutter would be the equivalent almost of a destroyer's with a firepower at that smaller class hull because I've sacrificed the ability to leave the system to give, give it additional weapons and shields. Well, I, I had an associate some years ago. He probably spent more time just using this half of this one book because he really loved and, and enjoyed the challenge of creating different kinds of ships and classes of ships. And he had a whole notebook. I have a notebook easily this thick somewhere of all the possible different combinations of ship components you can put together. And he didn't play much of the other stuff, but he really got off on doing this thing. And I'm just, and I said, hey, awesome, because you like it, you enjoyed it, and if I was selling this over a shelf, you just bought the book, and I made my two cents, whatever it is. So, this is what I'm talking about when I talk about having come from nothing, with nothing but in, in a, a lot of time on my hands, and not a lot of players or material to work with. I built this stuff, and uh, grew, and developed. So, so I, when I hear other guys talk about that they've created this or they 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 published that, I mean I fully understand and sympathize and uh, empathize with everything that they did and went through. So back to that so thing. It's just like having too many weapons or too many this or too many that. Well, I can't necessarily disagree with that. I mean, when you're trying to come up with categories of weaponry, you can have quite a bit. I, I simplified things for a certain degree, personal scale weapons, we're, we're talking about personal melee weapons, uh, swords and, 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 and of that nature, went by tech level and what they were, but when we got into more advanced technologies and stuff, I tried to simplify, I got long arms, which are all your rifles, I've got life support uh, light infantry support weapons, which are basically your some you know the machine guns and plasma rifle, heavy plasma can uh, rifles and stuff that would be considered a squad based weapon. You got your personal sidearms and carbines. And then we get into things like grenades and debt packs and plasma cutters, body armor, exotic armor, some exotic personal weapons such as an aquatic gyro jet pistol as an example. We get into small craft grade weapons and on and on and on. A lot of additional stuff. And a lot of this stuff came out when other guys said, well I want this or how do I do that or how can I do this and I had to come up with it. Now one of the things I don't have, if you look, there's a lot of stuff. I don't have a whole lot of fluff. I've got pretty much a straightforward description of what it is and what it's for. So, in this case, a simulation pod, individual cyberspace couches or enclosed pods that immerse the user in simulated environments so real the user is hard pressed to know the difference. If you think of Avatar and the and this unit the guy got into to control the Avatar, that's what you're talking about here. And I came up with this before Avatar came out as a movie, at least before I was familiar with it anyway. So, somebody can say, oh, you stole that idea. No, we didn't steal it. We build on the information of stuff that we're aware of. As long as I didn't call it what they called it, it works the way how it works doesn't make a lot of difference. And then, of course, things that get into more. I got an entire chapter on uh, cybernetics for body implants, bio organs, and things like that, and shuttles and ships and starfighters and tanks and all this other stuff. War nights to avoid the ad. To avoid the possibility of plagiarism or copyright, I chose not to call my mechs mechs. I chose them War Knights. And it sounds a little more archaic, it sounds a little more convoluted, but I remember a thing between Robotech and back Battletech way back in the day, and I thought, you know what, we'll just call them a War Knight. Something simple. It's a mech. Mech's a mech is a mech, but if I don't use the term as a title, it's not an issue. If I'm wrong, let me know. I always need to know this stuff. Appreciate it. So, like I said, a little bit longer than I wanted, but I thought I want to share, I want to get it out there. I also needed to test this new, this new rig thing I'm doing here. I'm 
can talk about the economy and how you work, how the uh, how the exchanges work, and how you make money and stuff. But you know, here's a tires. Here's a whole section on uh, bugs and, and bug tactics and so on and so forth. All the uh, all the uh, uh, Starship Troopers. And like I said, 100% capable of being played by yourself without another person at all. Just need pen and paper in the books. Although I will advocate that laptops make bookkeeping much so much much simpler. Just saying. Thank you for your time and your attention, and as always, welcoming comments and observations and anything of interest. And if you don't, you don't. So be it.